Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Our guest today is Toby Zhang, the founder and CEO of ShopLit Live, a live streaming platform that connects brands and merchants to consumers through immersive shopping experiences. Before founding ShopLit Live, Toby worked as a venture capital investor, investing in over 15 companies during his tenure. He's also worked as a product manager for Microsoft for several years. In our conversation, we discuss the benefits of having a U.S. company with a global distributed workforce, specifically in China, how to get them to work well together at a distance, including how to manage the time difference, the difference between Chinese and American engineers, including their salaries, attitude, and working time, and much more. So let's give Toby a warm welcome. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth, so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for joining us today, Toby. I know it's late over there in Silicon Valley. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk with us. No worries. Glad to be here. You have a very unique experience. You were born in China. You moved to America as a kid. You now live in Silicon Valley. You run a startup that is split between America and China. Let's talk about that. Yes, so I was born in Beijing. I、uh, grew up technically in the States,、uh, on the East Coast,、uh, and、uh, you know most of my education and career has been in the U.S. Now I I went to school at Michigan for my undergrad and master's in engineering.、Uh, went to get an MBA from UPenn,、uh, the Wharton School, and、uh, you know previously had led technical teams at big companies like Microsoft, and also have. I started multiple startups,、uh, and, and have also worked in venture capital for about six years,、uh, just before I, my my most recent startup. So yes, so my most recent startup is a company called Shop Lit Live, and we essentially are a social live shopping platform, and、uh, and and we help、uh, users and shoppers to discover very interesting and innovative products and brands personalized to them, and we help. Them to engage with sellers and brands through live shopping experiences, and this is something that's very prominent in Asia already,、uh, particularly in China. And in the U.S., it's just starting, and we are、uh, you know, pretty excited about being in this space, especially pretty early in the U.S. market for for live shopping. Talk about, if you will, what it's like having a team, not just a remote team, but specifically a team in China. And what it's like hiring them and and training them and you know as compared to Western employees or American employees. Almost all of our development team is in China. Our business development team is here in、uh, California. So first of all, there's a unique advantage for being able to hire and run a team in Shanghai in China, and that particular unique advantage is cost, right? So an average engineer here in the Bay Area costs about four to five times the salary of one. Of equal caliber in Shanghai, and、uh, these are just quite frankly、um, unfair. So from our perspective, is you know we love to kind of hire very capable engineers, you know who work very very hard and who are very very motivated, and we actually pay them above market price、uh, in Shanghai, but we still、uh, you know leveraging that kind of different cost structure there, it's a lot more cost efficient for us to run engineering teams there than hiring locally here in the Bay Area. And the other advantage there is it's actually the time difference. So you, as you can imagine, right now, at 6 p.m. Pacific time, it's actually 10 a.m. in China. So you know, it, it helps our team to to actually run、uh, kind of around the clock, where our business development team is you know very active during the day, while you know our engineering team is very active、uh, in the evening. Uh, local time here in the Bay Area. For their time, it's you know daytime in China. So that actually gives us quite a bit of、uh, kind of you know efficiencies on being able to really quickly turn around features,、uh, you know fix things、uh, in the in the evening while you know 
people are sleeping and users are not that active during the day, when, you know, we'll have things ready to go, uh, you know, in the mornings, et cetera, uh, you know, when, when, when the day starts here in the U.S. So that time difference, uh, we actually use it to our advantage. So when you hire people in Shanghai, are you only hiring Chinese nationals or are you also hiring foreigners living in China too? Great question. We hire anyone that's capable. For example, you know, we have iOS developers, Android developers, web developers, backend developers, et cetera. So we have a list of you know, roles we need to fill, and we go through uh, you know, recruiting channels to, to acquire the best talent. So some of these talents you know, are you know, expats returning to China. Some of them are foreign natives. Some of them are you know, natives based in China. And particularly for what we are doing is that we're looking for folks who have experiences in social media, uh, building, you know, live streaming or e-commerce apps before and have experiences operating in the space. And quite fortunate that we're able to you know, put together a, a, a kind of a stellar team while having those you know, pretty strict requirements on what, what, what we need. And some of our team members are expats uh, who has studied and lived abroad for many, many years and has returned to China. And uh, we're very fortunate to be able to uh, to have them joining our team. Would you say that your China operations uses English as the language of instruction and, and communication? That's a really good question. Actually, most of our engineering team meetings are actually done in Mandarin. But as you can imagine, our product is actually English native. So our developers and development team are very uh, capable in English and uh, are, are, are fluent in the language. So that despite the fact that we conduct business in Mandarin, uh, when we build our product, uh, it's completely English. The team in general, it's more familiar and more comfortable communicating day to day in Mandarin. You have this Chinese team taking an essentially a Chinese concept, trying to localize it to America and to the West. What makes you think that a Chinese team is the right one to do that? Why not an American team since they understand America? So we are a U.S.-based company, and actually our business development team is all a U.S.-based team. Local knowledge, local operating team, local business development team, it's essential for building this uh, in America. And, and we have that. And that's how we build our business development team, how we build our operations team, our, our, our merchant uh, partnership team, etc., is your business development team responsible for telling the engineers how to develop the function and the feel of the application? Or are you leaving the UI UX to the China side team? Our product management, our product design, our you know, design team, UI UX is all done here uh, you know, by people who have basically you know, well-versed, you know, deep-rooted backgrounds in, in the US. So how does that work if they're not physically in the same place? Our design team and our product management team, you know, they, these folks are mostly active in the late evenings. Their morning starts later than our business development team. So the collaborative hours between our product team and the development team in Shanghai are actually quite like overlap quite quite well in the evenings. So just to, to give an example, right, we have our daily team meetings at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, which is 10.30 a.m. in Shanghai. So, so between 6.30 to roughly like 8 p.m., it's where you know, we have meetings every day and that goes through uh, all the development progress, uh, we think on different like issues, bugs or features, et cetera, releases and all that. And then even after that meeting is done, uh, you know, into the late evening until like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., et cetera, which is roughly 6 p.m. Uh, by 2 a.m. it will be 6 p.m. in Shanghai. All of that time is the collaborative time between our product development team in Shanghai and our product management folks here. You've figured out a really smooth way to make that work. I guess that's how the world is going to be going. Globalization over the last few years kind of hit fever pitch. Companies are uh, trying to figure out how to get the best talent and and now that everybody's able to work remotely, you literally can hire wherever. And I think it's, it's good for the world uh, because it gives people in developing nations an opportunity to really grow their career and improve their skills and hopefully add value, especially when you're paying them well enough that they can not only survive, but also thrive. And when you have people thriving, then their local communities and their families thrive. And I'm all for globalization. And let's talk a little bit more about globalization and kind of what you've seen, especially on the Asia side. There are some really interesting underlying trends in globalization that uh, 
I think it's making today's world, uh, you know, more collaborative in one form or another. Uh, in the most recent years, TikTok, for example, you know, these are companies that you know, no matter where they're based, they actually provide products and services to audiences around the globe. And then there are other companies in other industries that does similar things. So, for example, you know, in the cryptocurrency or in the blockchain space, you know, there are many companies that are not based in North America. They're based in you know, Southeast Asia, Asia, or, or, or maybe even a you know, remote island country. They're running you know, th- their business there, but really you know, providing products and services to you know, audiences globally. That is something that today is pretty prominent. Uh, companies that are either globally distributed or companies that are specifically located in a particular locale, but be able to you know, pro- provide products and services globally. When I look at the startup ecosystem in a given country, let's say Vietnam, for example, they generally are not building for a global audience. I don't just see this in Vietnam. I also see this in Japan and Korea and Philippines and most Southeast Asian countries that I look at. Do you think that's going to change? Do you think we'll see more countries in Southeast Asia trying to take on a more global role? I think so. I think it really comes down to kind of the business opportunities that's you know, available for them to capture, I guess, in, in the near term versus, you know, more mid to long term, right? So if, say, in a local market where there is a tremendous amount of opportunities, they should grab those local market first, thrive and, and do really well, and, uh, and and then continue to kind of expand, uh, you know, to kind of more distant markets, right? So I think one of, um, one of such examples, it's a, it's a company called Shopee. So Shopee is a company, you know, that focused, you know, quite a bit in the local market first before expanding to kind of more widely in Southeast Asia. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll start to see more of those companies emerging. Globalization is something that is starting to permeate different parts of the, the world. And being in Asia, I think it's the most fascinating place to be right now and makes it the easiest place to see these things actually happening in real time. And so, as we were just mentioning, that kind of reflects in the salary is changing. So let's talk a little bit more about that. You said before that you pay your people in China above market rates. So let's talk about the the markets in China, the different tier cities we'd mentioned earlier and, and how salaries are different in each of those places. Those prices have also increased from year to year, but it's still significantly less than what it is here in the Bay Area. So if we take a look at salary levels for engineer in Shanghai, Say someone with maybe seven to eight years of experience, let's just take the example of an iOS developer. Typical salary range for this person, uh, assuming you know, uh, if he comes from a, a you know, tier one or tier two school, uh, you know, their, their salary range can range anywhere between 15K RMB to like 30K RMB, or the median probably falls you know, somewhere around like 20, 25K. This is roughly like $3,000, $4,000 all in. There's something in China called like 996 type of work style, which means they work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Many companies have these kind of policies around employees working on weekends. It's more commonplace than, than rare. And then if we look at a similar engineer who has you know, probably you know, eight years of experience, mobile app developer in the Bay Area, uh, either work for a big company or, or early stage startups, you know, their starting salary is somewhere like 200K, 250K, uh, all in. So this includes you know, employee benefits and things like that. And quite frankly speaking, a lot of engineers in the Bay Area are very, in my opinion, spoiled. So what's something that uh, you've learned recently that you want to implement? I guess two things I thought it's really interesting that I have been doing. One, it's uh, meditation, uh, something that I just picked up. And uh, it, it helps your day to be really efficient. Essentially, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, it's kind of like a big energy booster. Yeah, and I actually think meditation is really, really fun. Um, you know, it's a lot more than I, I initially anticipated. And the second thing, I think, it's reading. So growing up, reading, it's, it's something that, you know, we're all very familiar with. I think Elon Musk said something where, like, you can be an expert in anything that you do. Uh, it just requires three things. You know, read more books, right? So now I'm a firm believer in, in that, actually. Um, you know, if I want to get smarter about marketing, if I want to get smarter about human resources, et cetera, you know, there are plenty of kind of uh, li- literature uh, and books that's out there that actually help, helps me to, uh, you know, to, to, to get smarter. Essentially absorb a lot of the experiences uh, you know, from, from folks that 
came before. And that is really cool. So I would say the two other things that I've been doing more recently, it's reading and meditation. One of the guests I recently interviewed said that he used an app called Headspace to learn how to start meditating. And now he uses something called Insight Timer to help him stay focused during the meditation. So it might be something interesting for you to try. And reading is fantastic. I try to read all the time. I've got a book uh, in front of me right now, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow by Yuval Noah Harari. I always will go and when I have time, I'll go to the bookstore and I'll look for books to buy. I'll buy three, four, five books at a time. I'll read one. I'll hand it to my fiance. Or if I know I'm going to be meeting somebody and I know that they'll like that book, I'll just give them the book. And I'll say, when you finish this book, give it to somebody else. Just keep spreading the knowledge. You know, I find that to be a really good way because not everybody has the the time to go to the bookstore or they don't have the means to afford buying the book, giving them access to knowledge is a great way to improve them. And if you spend time improving the people around you, then you're making the world a better place. Agreed. What is the most important piece of advice that you could give the audience something that you've learned in your life? Take risks. Take as much risk as possible to be able to have a chance at more outsized rewards, right? So, so, so I mean, don't take risks just for the purpose of taking risks, but take risks for those that may have a, a outsized outcome. If we were to then think about someone's life, and then one of the concepts that we, we were taught in school and by our parents, which I think was in, taught incorrectly, is is that you can get rich by getting a big salary. Actually, in the world, other than celebrities and movie stars, no one is able to become really wealthy by taking a salary. The only way to get wealthy or to build wealth is to actually trade your salary for equity. So take ownership in things that has the opportunity to grow quickly and grow big. And that's something, that's a misconception that was being taught you know, over the last few generations, I think, uh, in schools and, and by, our, by our parents. And I think that I really motivate our young, younger folks to really think about that deeply, right? I mean, let's just take, for example, uh, you know, someone who makes 100,000 US dollars a year in salary. That's a very decent salary, uh, probably twice the, the medium income here in the US. Taking out taxes, uh, and that's roughly you know, 50% or, 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 or you know, a little bit over 50% left. And then if you take out your rental costs or your, your expenses, and et cetera, what's left is probably 20% of that. So on the year, you know, at 100K salary, you probably save around like $20,000, right? And in order for you to save a million dollars, you have to essentially work for 50 years at a hundred thousand dollar salary that's roughly the entire working life of uh, of an adult right you have one million dollars in saving and that's not even factoring inflation so you know i really kind of motivate young folks to think about you know if you have a chance uh you know to take a risk to work for a smaller business to take an ownership on the upside while you know taking a slightly less salary or, or, or you know, taking just enough salary to be able to live and be okay, you, know, you may have that opportunity to be able to actually you know, have a much bigger result. But that's something you know, I wish when I was younger that, uh, that school or, 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 or you know, teachers would have taught more. Well, unfortunately, school doesn't prepare us for life. And those teachers can't teach you that because they're trading their time for money too. So they didn't have that life experience. So how could they teach us something that they haven't known? Anyways, that could be a totally different episode all on its own. You know, this has been a very interesting conversation. Let's end it with uh, you telling everybody how they can find you online. Thanks, everyone, uh, you know, for tuning in. You know, I'm on LinkedIn, so you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, just Toby Zhang. I'm happy to connect and uh, you know, share more about you know what I'm doing, what I'm up to. Uh, you can also you know, you know, tune in to to our exciting startup. It's called Shop Lit Live. So if you go to the App Store, you should be able to find under Lit Live. So L I T, L I V E, and then uh, tune in to our exciting live shopping shows. So. Yeah, looking forward to stay connected. Great. Thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. And don't forget, entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. 